Why don't you open up your Bibles to the book of Philippians? Book of Philippians. That's the third book of the Bible, just after Exodus. <laughs> All right, repeat this after me. Father, let your word change my heart and shape my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. I don't know about you, but um, myself, I, I suffer quite a bit from a thing called irrational anxiety. I don't know about you, but I, I get that quite a bit. Um, yeah, there, there are times where I just watching TV and, and I think about waking up and I'm buried in a box underground. Has anyone ever thought of that before? That how freaky that would be to wake up buried in a box buried underground. Anyone ever thought that before? Thanks, man. I was just, I'm the only weird one in the house, you know. You know, we get these thoughts sometimes, these ways that we do things, and it brings in an irrational anxiety in our lives. Uh, my wife and I, we, on our honeymoon, we visited the US of A. Uh, we decided to go on a great honeymoon trip uh, to Disney World in Florida. And I went on this ride. It was called the Alien Ride. And at that stage, that was Sigourney Weaver, you know, Alien. <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. It was the big hit ride um, and, uh, or movie, actually. And I went on this ride. And there are two rides I hate. I hate, I hate rides that spin, you know, and I hate rides that drop. I just can't stand those rides. So I walked into a, a similar thing like this, like a sort of an auditorium, but it was around in a circle. And I went, oh, no. And, and, and in Disney World, you can't get out once you're in. That's it, you know. So I'm in, and you sit down in a chair like why Sam sat down in a chair, and, and it was around in a circle, and in the middle was this glass dome, and all these lights were, were around it. I'm sitting in, in, in this round circle, and all of a sudden, this, like, roller coaster padding come over the top of me and locked me in. So, so here I'm in an around circle ride and I'm just thinking to myself, this thing's going to spin and I'm going to throw up everywhere. I'm locked in, I can't get out anywhere at all. Then the ride kicks up, it sits in and there's this little shake and up on the screen comes this man. He says, oh, welcome to such and such whatever space station and we're about to head on out. Uh, there is word that there's been an alien outbreak on this planet. And, uh, we, you know, just the whole thing like Sigourney Weaver, the movie Alien, the whole deal, you know. So you think you're in this ride, you know. And I said, look, just want to let you all know why you're on this ride. Uh, we actually do have a captured alien on board that we're actually transporting to this planet so that we can lock it up and it, it won't be there anymore, um, as you, you know, say. And so well, I'm thinking, oh, that's all cool, you know, how cool is this ride's going to spin, it's all going to be great. So if you want to think, and then all of a sudden, gee, 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 lights are flashing everywhere everywhere the thing goes pitch black dark there is smoke everywhere I'm locked in this thing it is dark I cannot see in front of my face I'm seeing this glass dome and this lights flashing in the middle of this room this massive big like fish tank glass dome Shh. and all of a sudden this alien creature <laughs> and I'm thinking oh it's okay it's locked behind this glass dome you know it's all okay I'm only locked in this chair I can't move, but it's okay, you know. It's not a real alien, but I'm thinking it's a real alien, you know. And then all of a sudden, the lights go pitch black dark, this massive big screech, and all of a sudden, broken glass sound. And the light flashes, and the alien is out. It is out. Now, there is no alien, but I'm thinking it is out, you know. I'm getting all irrational here. Pitch black dark got speakers in my headphone set and you start to hear this squeal of this alien <coughs> as it's screaming around the room. There is no alien, but I'm irrationally thinking of this alien racing around the room as I hear the voice going from speaker to speaker. <coughs> as it comes past you, you get this brush of wind. <sighs> comes past you like this obviously it's some smoke thing that brushes wind but it's not an alien but I can feel it coming past me and then all of a sudden it just stops and you hear in here <sighs> I'm locked in a chair it's pitch black dark an alien is out and I have this breath in my face <sighs> 
All I can do is imagine there is this alien going to absolutely eat me alive, you know. Oh, we get so irrational at times, don't we? It's just a ride. There's no such thing as aliens. My daughter, she screeches many times from the bathroom. Ah, Daddy, I can't do my hair. There's a spider in there. It's huge. It's massive. And you get up there and it's like the size of an ant. You know what I mean? Are you dead set? You cannot do your hair because of this ant sort of spider that is there. We get irrational. My other daughter just can't walk up the end of the corridor because it's dark. How many of you have been like that? Amen. We have a father in heaven that looks down on his children. How many times he must say, how irrational are you right now? When life comes against us and we have problems and issues, we get all irrational, don't we? We lose our job and then all of a sudden we get irrational anxiety. I want to tell you tonight, there are two kind of messages we could have. We could have a message that is relational, side by side, something for our community. Or we could have a message that's vertical, means reaching out to God. It's a shape of a cross. And let me tell you, you cannot reach out to your community until you first reach up to your God. Tonight's message is about you and me reaching up to God because we cannot be paralyzed by irrational thinkings in our lives. Let me tell you right now, it doesn't matter how much you think you should freak out in life, our God is more than able to conquer all things. You must know tonight, if... My God is for me. Nobody, nothing could ever be against me. Tonight we want to boot kick irrational anxiety. It cripples us to the core. Amen. Who's with me? All right. You're there. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. Starts off and it says this. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. You know, Paul here, the writer of this scripture, he wants to change a mindset that we have in our mind. I've got to, you've got to have some underlining things to this. Paul wants to help correct something here. That's why he writes to the Philippians. He says, there are things that we're afraid of. That's what he's saying. There are, there are things in our lives that cause us to go a certain direction. There are things we do not understand. There, there are things in our lives that cause us to shut down, cause us to be crippled, Cause us to, um, to not stretch out, cause us to become internal, to go into our rooms, to go within ourselves. There are things in life that you may come across, he's trying to say, that are totally senseless. But if you would only, only, only weigh it up to the God that we serve, you would realize how stupid you are, how silly we become. How anxious we become, how senseless we become. Paul's trying to say here, be anxious for absolutely nothing. There are things that we can overcome, but we choose not to. There are things that come against us that we can push aside, but we choose to let it affect us. Paul starts off in the writing and he says, be anxious for nothing. Paul has no idea what we are going through. Paul, have you not seen the TV the last couple of days? The terror that raises up, the turmoil and the death in Paris. Paul, you've got no idea what you're writing here. Who are you, Paul? Look, you wrote the two-thirds of the New Testament. Wow, he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. How wonderful are you, Paul? But Paul, you have no idea what's going on in my life. Paul, you do not understand that by next week my electricity bill needs to be paid or it's going to be shut down. Paul, you have no idea about my young teenager who's hooked on ice and going for it. Paul, you have no idea. Paul, you have no idea of the turmoil in my marriage. My husband's being unfaithful. Who are you, Paul? Silly Paul. Oh, it's nice to say that now, Paul. You're walking through heaven. It's all okay now, Paul. You're walking around Jesus. Paul would aptly say back to us, my friends, you have no idea. 
I actually wrote this while I was in bondage and in chains in prison, where I was being beaten daily, where I was being tortured and tormented, where I was closed up in chains for things that I did not do wrong. I was maybe falsely accused, but all I did in my life is stood up for what was real. I just preached a good word that people, that Jesus loves you. And here I am living my life. Two thirds of my life I live locked in a prison, a dirty prison full of rats. It is not like prison that we have today where there is internet and TV and all the luxuries. And we're talking hardcore prison here. We're locked up for life where all he could do was look and hope that one day he could be released. The Paul that says, I have learnt, I have learnt to be comfortable in the goods and the bads. My friends, you have no idea, he says back to us, that while locked in prison, I write this to you. Be anxious for nothing. He is more than qualified to write this first line. Paul wasn't thinking irrationally at all, was he? Paul was trusting in his God. It says, be anxious. You know what that word anxious means? I mean, it starts off with the word be. And, and when I look through the scriptures, a lot of times that word be comes from something that's very stern and strong. Like when God spoke to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. It's like, this is an assignment, brother. Be, you know, and a, a state of existence. Be, I'm being right now, you know. Be, it says, be anxious for nothing. Uh, the word anxious there has a couple of different terminologies, but one of them is obviously that cares and problems overtake your life. They take control of you. But another one, let me read this one out. I find this one very interesting. It says, to, st- to seek to promote one's interest. Let me explain that. So what happens is, is that you walk through life, you see something, it stresses you or distresses you, you look at it, you analyse it, you take that and you go, you know what, I'm now going to promote that in my life and lift it up. Even though I think right now that it's not right, I'm going to now focus all of my attention on this. I lift it up and I promote it. Have you ever seen a promotion on TV? They just go all day long, don't they? Bam, 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 buy from Aldi. Bam, 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 buy from Aldi until you buy from Aldi. They promote it, don't they? This is what we do when concerns come our way. We lift it up, we promote it, and we visit it all the time. Paul is starting off here. He says, friends, wake up. Be Anxious for nothing. You tell me nothing, like absolutely nothing, like not even a little thing. How about be anxious for some things? He says nothing. I believe this cripples us because we're just too busy being absorbed by the things that are really not important. Really not important. We need to change our focus. Paul wants us to know how much we mean to God and to begin to train ourselves to believe that God is for us. Paul stirs us up in these beginning phrases saying, be anxious absolutely for nothing. Know this today, that if you are a child of God, it is not right that you are intimidated by what life or people try to throw your way. As a child of the living God, it is not right that you allow this to stress you. It's not right that we promote it in our lives. (sighs) Hundred scriptures come into my mind. You ever thought about that if your God is for you, that no one can be, nothing, nothing can be against you. It sort of like changes this whole perspective, doesn't it? Book of Matthew chapter 6 has this great portion of scripture that Jesus talked about. He says, do not worry about anything. You ever heard that one before? He says, you know, why do you worry about the clothes that you wear? Why do you worry about tomorrow? 
Why do you worry? Can't you see the lilies of the field? They clothe themselves. Do not worry because today already has enough. You know that whole portion of scripture? You know what that word, that worry, is this, anxious. It's the same Greek word. How many times does he have to say, do not worry about it? In other words, I can take care of all things. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything. See, it's specific with its wording. It doesn't say be anxious for something, but in some things. No, it says be anxious for nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Don't let anxiety get to you. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. It's a weird line, that, because I thought that God knows everything before we pray it. Isn't he not the all-knowing God? Doesn't he know my thoughts? Doesn't he know my plans? Why do I need to ask? Why? Why, God? Yet, can you not see, God, that I'm struggling right now? Why do I need to ask? Because that's faith. And that's how faith operates and God operates. Because without faith, there is nothing. You need to step out in faith. God honours the movement of your faith. That in your distress, you reach out to him. In your worry, you reach out to him. In your circumstances, you reach out to him. Even though he sees you, even though he knows it, even before you were born, he knew about it. But he says, look at my child. And he says, as you draw near to me, bam, I am going to draw near to you. It says, let your request be named to God. And then the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Has anyone ever in a car taken over somebody else? You get in that slipstream. Have you ever been in that state where you're racing someone? I know you guys don't race around Springfield. I know you don't do that. I know you don't get sideways and try to think you're all, you know, fast and furious. All right. I can see some of your dads in your vans doing it. (laughs) Sideways action. But you know what? It's like that, you know. When I go road cycling, it's like that. Uh, I'm only 67 and a half kilos, and I ride with a guy who's about 85 kilos to 90 kilos. Going uphill, no worries at all, man. I'll leave you behind. Going downhill, he has more weight. <laughs> so I have learned very quickly to get in his slipstream, and I sit behind him, and I get sucked along. Sucked along with him. And then when I just want to give him a little bit more, I pull out and I'll just move straight past him. I can surpass him even though I am uh, like don't weigh as much. But I surpass him with less energy because I just sit in his work. The peace of God will do that for you. It surpasses you. You see, that's what he said. And the peace of God surpasses my understanding. I do believe it's our mind that gets in the way of a lot of things. It takes a good adult Christian with a stupid mind to mess up Christianity. It really does. But God says, my peace will surpass your mind. When you're looking at a situation or a circumstance, when you're looking at a problem, God, I have no idea where my job is coming from. You can ask God and His peace will surpass your thoughts. It won't be a worldly intervention, but a Holy Ghost inspired inspired intervention into your life it will surpass you it surpasses your lack it surpasses your insignificance it surpasses all the things that you don't like about yourself when you do not believe in yourself God still believes in you when you're not walking in the right way he's still there for you and his peace surpasses you great because God gets all the glory but it's great because we can't mess it up But the line starts with be anxious for nothing. If you're going to be anxious and if you don't do all these things, like in supplication or in thanksgiving, if you don't make your request made known to God, the peace will never be there. It it starts on the first line. B. It's a state that you have to get into in prayer. It's a place you need to walk into. I don't know about you, and I speak this at the men in the house. When your wife is in turmoil and your kids are going nuts and you know the enemy is just causing stress and problem, are you going to be happy with the fact 
that the enemy has just walked into the door of your house. Think about it. When the problems are arising and you're not doing anything about it, are you going to be happy that the enemy is taking control of your house? That's a time where you need to be. And they need to be anxious for nothing. But in all things, I love this, in supplication, thanksgiving, made your request be known to God, then the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will what? Guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It will guard it. It will guard it from disappointment. It will guard it from shame. It will guard it from all the things that are necessary. The fiery darts will not get in there because you're in that place with God. You're encompassed by God. He's surpassing you. Your peace, the peace of God is there. It says be anxious for nothing. You know, there are four things that we have that, that I've seen that are ways that we get really, really anxious all the time. This, you know, irrational anxiety. Number one is this, is by the words that we speak. Uh, we do this really well. Oh, I, I don't know, that's going to work. Oh, I think you're dreaming there. No. Are you serious? You really think you can do that? And I'm sure there are hundreds of others. The words we speak are so powerful. The words frame our worlds. It's a picture frame. You frame it. Are you the Mona Lisa or some like, you know, hmm, that's pretty scary. Framed, scriptures say. It says that death and life is in the power of the tongue. There was an exercise that was done once. Uh, they wanted to see the power of words and the power of songs and volumes of music. And so they had two rooms. They put a pot plant in each room, same pot plant. And in one room, through a speaker, they played continually death metal just all day long it just kept going and going oh, i love that stuff man just oh, i love it i don't have a problem with it at all and in the other room they played like choir and orchestral music it wasn't too long and the plant in the dead room in that um, mega death room died and the plant in the orchestral room rose and grew your words are extremely powerful. You know what's interesting when it says it, that death and life is in the power of the tongue? We then have the power to speak death or to speak life. Mm. Get that out of my heart. So when you say something, you frame it. So is there death in it or is there life in it? When you speak at something, when you say something, when you go to do something, are you encouraging are you doubting? Are you pulling down? And it also says that we can pull down strongholds, but we can pull down people's dreams as well. You can squash things in people's lives by not being sensitive enough. Because we're not in the right place, we're not in the right mind. Sometimes you can see somebody doing something that you tried to do many years ago and go, ha ha, we'll see why you're going to go. What am I going to sit back cheer you on as you fail? Death and life is in the power of your tongue. So what are you speaking about your life? How are you framing it right now? Second thing that we always do, brings on this irrational anxiety, is by the way we approach things. Oh, that, that's never going to happen. The dream that Breakthrough has, man, that's just too big. That's never going to happen. You've got to be kidding me. We think these things. We speak these things. By the way that we approach things, we... We do this. You know, it says that as you believe a man who believes in his heart, so he is. It says that if you believe in your heart, then you what shall be saved. And it says confess with your mouth, but that's coming on to another point. But believe, you know, believing in your heart is a lot. How you approach things, how you do things. A rational anxiety comes because we do not approach things correctly. We see a situation. Oh, this happened to me. Last time, you watch, it's going to happen again. My wife says it all the time. It's funny though, she says, and we have a laugh about it now, we've worked that one through. But she says these things. When we go to do a family event, she now asks me to organise it. Because every time she does, something happens wrong. 
We're going to the park next week. That's a family day. We're going to the park. And it will bucket down rain for days. It's supposed to be sunny. When she goes to organise something, we get there and it's shut. When she tries to organise something, we can't get a car park. Oh, look, we're going to go to this restaurant because I know I can get this meal. When we get there, I'm sorry, we're out of that meal. This just happens to her. And so she started saying, man, it always happens to me. I said, well, why don't you organise? No, 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 you watch because when I do it, it's going to fail. We had to change that. Because it's the way we approach things. A lot of our irrational anxiety that we get is because of silly habits of the way that it was. I, I just don't understand why we do this. I'm in the same boat. I tell you, I tell you, I'm in the same boat. Irrational behaviour, we've got to get rid of it. It's the way you approach things. You've got to change those kind of things. Number three is just by the way that we listen to other voices, other people. So number one was what? By the way we speak our word. Number two is by the way we approach things. Number three is just by the way we listen to other voices. Oh, you'll never do that. You'll never do that. Maybe you had a parent that used to talk to you like that. You're never going to amount to anything, son. Come over here, let me give you a whooping. That'll teach you. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've been stupid. Excuse me if I was not sensitive there either as well. By the way, we listen to what people say to us. I don't find that in the scriptures. I think we should be listening to what God says about us. What are you going to put into your ears? What, what are you going to hear? What are you going to absorb into your heart? What are you, what are you going to say? What are, you, what are you going to do in those situations? Bible scripture says that you are more than a conqueror. Do you choose to believe that? Are you above and not beneath? Are you the head and not the tail? I don't know. You can be the tail if you like. If you want to wag it, go wag. I prefer to have the head. It's got a bit of brain in it, you know. Number four is this. By the way that we expect things. Most of the time we go to do something or venture out and do something and we have this expectation in our head. This is the way it's going to be. Because you know what? This is, what, this is the way it was last time. It was so awesome. So it's going to be like that again. Who's ever had one of those situations where you've gone and done something and it's so cool, it's the best ever, and then you try to replicate that next time and it's never close again? We get this expectation in our head, don't we? You know, We go on holidays and there's just this image you get. You know, A lot of us have this expectation. A lot of uh, young ladies have this expectation when they get married. They just have this Hollywood way that marriage is. The first kiss is just going to sweep me off my teeth. Oh, man. He's just going, woo! Oh, it's going to be just like that. He's going to pick me up. He's going to lap it on me. It's just going to be the best thing. It's going to be light. Ching! It's just going to be everything, isn't it? And then it's an absolute schmozzle across the car and he falls in your face, bangs into your eye. You know what I mean? We have this expectation, don't we? You know, I suffer from this really, really badly because being a chef for many, 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 many years... I have an expectation when I go to a restaurant and eat something. I read the words on the menu, you know, 350, oh sorry, I'll make it better, 480 rump steak, bar grilled, slow cooked, mash veg, red wine jus, you know, you read this you just go, oh, it's 48 bucks for two and I'm going to pay for it right now. Because you read it. You, get, you know, you get this thing in your head, don't you? you see that steak and you think, oh man, this chef back there, I can see him. He's, it's, this is my steak. He's going to take all, he's going to be gentle to it. He's just going to cook it the best ever as if like, man, this is the best steak I've ever done. You know, and I'm, I'm thinking this, you know, the plate's going to come, the service is going to be great. The plate will be nice and warm, keep my meal a bit more warmer. The steak's going to be perfect, no blood coming out of it, you know, be medium but rested really well, seasoned, just absolute perfect. It's going to melt in my mouth. In fact, because it's a Wagyu, oh, the ripples of fat, it's just going to melt. It's going to be like butter. It's just like, you know, you just sit there and you get this mind, you go, oh, how awesome this is. And then it comes to you and it drop it on in front of you and it's just like this is dog's breakfast man what is with you <laughs> I'm coming in the kitchen I'm going to show you how to do this buddy you call this a steak you know it's a mistake bro <laughs> you know don't we we get these preconceived conceptions about how things are it is so true isn't it you know that same principle is with everything we do in life it's by the way we expect things Scripture says that as we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth. 
How we do everything in our life depends on how we do it. You became saved because you believed in your heart and then you confessed with your mouth. You kept it just as that. But you can actually take that whole philosophy and destroy your life with it. You can believe in your heart that you can do nothing. Then you can confess it with your mouth that you're going to be a failure. It's the same principle. Because the death and the life is there. This is why Paul writes this. This is why he states it. This is why he, he speaks about this. This is why him, locked in chains, being beaten every day, falsely accused, living a life sold out to God, and the only way they could shut him up was lock him in prison, but that didn't work because I read in the Scriptures, they started singing songs and the whole jail got saved. But they tried again and again and again. And him, most qualified that he is, says this, My friends, be anxious for nothing. Do not believe what's said to you. Do not believe what's said about you. Don't believe this. Shut your mouth if you can't say anything right. Doesn't matter about the problem because my God is bigger and greater. Now with, look at this, supplication. That's it. That's the one you got to do. Get in there, grind it through. With thanksgiving, Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. I might not speak well over my wife, but from this day forth, I will. God, my son, I just want to nail him to the wall with a nail gun. You want to talk about being crucified for Christ? Let me show you. You know, I know there are times you want to do this. I know your family members are not right, but it depends on how you pray for them and see them. What do you believe they are? What, are we all perfect now that we're saved? Oh, we were great. Oh, no, man. Man, I was purely qualified for the kingdom of God. Man, that was it, man. You know, I just came in and God went, hey, look at this guy. He's in. He's, he's so good. He's so good. Look at you, you little good boy. I want in here. We're all the same. What's the difference now? How God saw you and me is how we see others. That's the great commission, the great commandment. This is why if you do not have a vertical relationship with Christ, you will never have a horizontal responsibility to others well enough. You'll be crippled yourself. You won't display it right to others. You won't give good advice. We have a city that is crying. We have a city that is hopeless. We have a city that's in despair. We have a city that has no answers. And what we want to come, we want to come to them in a crippled state. Hello, brother, let me tell you how much Jesus loves you all. Oh, that's just great. And then my world crashes. Ah! And I freak out. No, but should we not be the peace in the storm? How can we ever be that if we don't apply ourselves to it? Be anxious for nothing. With supplication and with thanksgiving. Make your request known to God. That what? His peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and guard your mind. What? Through Christ Jesus.